Okay, let's make sure the audio is working. Okay, let's make sure the audio is working. It is. All right, that's great. Um, okay, guys, so let's get into it today. Friday. Uh, I think last time I was uh, bragging about how nice it was here in California, and you guys are definitely having a better day out in Wyoming because it is nightmarishly hot and my house has no air conditioning. So uh, I'm dying. Um, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. Uh, all right. It's like 92. Um, and I have every fan on in my house. All right. Residue theorem. This is what we're getting into today. Um, by the way, everyone seemed like they did pretty good on the last homework. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too it was kind of tough, but hopefully the extra time made it all right. Um, all grades are in there up to date. Um, I do want to say that anyone who has uh, fallen behind on homework and is having their grade hurt by it, um, please uh, send me an email. Um, if you have like you know partially completed assignments you didn't turn in, we can maybe work out some something there. As I said at the beginning of class, um, the homework is really you know built to be an experience for you to get practice with the material before the exams. The first exam is definitely uh, over the easiest material. As you might have noticed, the class has sort of ramped up in difficulty a little bit from the beginning. Um, so please uh, get ahead, of, get on top of stuff earlier rather than later. If you start to feel worried about your grade, let me know earlier and we can try to work through things. If you are worried about your grade and you tell me um, after the final, it is a little bit harder to come up with a way to uh realistically get you a few more points and um you know it, it, of course in exchange for you showing that you actually understand the material um it's a lot easier to do that earlier on so anyways let's get into it today talk about the residue theorem theorem or chapter uh section 4.2 it's basically one theorem we're going to go through the residue theorem we're going to do an example or two we're going to talk about the proof um, there are a few different proofs presented in your textbook. Uh, realistically, there is an easy proof, a very easy proof, that we are already ready to do with, that has very little formalism. And we're going to kind of go into that one because it really brings a few things that we put together earlier um, into focus in, in terms of what's going on here. Uh, the place where this intuitive proof maybe requires a little bit more sophistication is relatively minor and um we'll, we'll we'll bring that up next time and go into a few um extensions of the residue theorem and some additional caveats but to begin let's get into it this is a one theorem day so hopefully i can give you a little bit of time back on friday by talking about the residue theorem pretty quickly so let's do it all right theorem 4.2.1 the residue theorem it's cool it's like the generalized uh, deformation theorem combined with uh, Cauchy's integral formula. Um, I mean, remember, the previous thing we've seen with residues is that it basically works exactly like how um, things go in Cauchy's integral formula in general. But instead now, instead of dealing with Taylor series, we're now dealing with Laurent expansions. Um, and so what we're going to get here is basically the uh, fancy form of Cauchy's integral formula that we uh, employed before on problems on the last exam in things in uh, what homework five or six or something um, when we combine that with the generalized deformation theorem so here's the statement let's let a be a region remember a region means a non-empty open connected subset of the complex plane and we'll let z1 through zn be elements of this region um, and distinct points in A, distinct elements. That's that's important actually. So if F is analytic on A, except for those points, um, and those points are isolated singularities of F, then for any closed curve gamma, homotopic to a point in A, in A homotopic to a point in A, um, such that no ZI lies on gamma. It's kind of a lot of assumptions at the beginning, right? But it. It just takes a while to say this. It, it Basically, we're ruling out the silly kind of like, oh, what about this? Pathological cases. We've got a region. We've got a number of points. They're isolated singularities of the function f, which is analytic everywhere except at those places. And none of those places lie on the curve we're looking at. OK, then when I integrate about that curve around that guy, 
what I get is 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of f at these zi and the index of gamma with respect to these zi. So another uh, kind of the thing to see if you if you don't recall, remember we had um, back in back in the world of Cauchy's integral theorem, we had something that looked like um, you know we had like f of z naught um, given by you know like a integral um, one over two pi i right, and we had some kind of an integral right um, gamma. F of Z over Z minus C naught, DZ or something, right? You know, this whole business, right? This is basically, and maybe we should actually put an index in here. That was when we just had it with a circle, right? Index gamma Z naught, right? This whole, this whole business, right? Okay, anyways, so that, that whole business aside, looking at these two things, you're sort of seeing that the residue here is taking the place of this value which is sensible given how we've been looking at some things before. That is, it's sort of like a, well, like what we did with like a L'Hopital's rule, right? When you take like F over G and you can't deal with that, you know, you take some derivatives or something and then you get it out of there. It's the same kind of business. While F is analytic everywhere except these points, they're isolated singularities. And so the residue piece right here basically tells you what, I don't want to say what you should get because it's not, exactly the case that f is equal to like should be equal to the residue at that point but it's more like what we were talking about where you could write a function f of z as something like you know like a z minus z to the k like phi z right and this was this was a situation where you had like a zero of order k right and so that's that that's a type of ice or i mean um sorry uh, a pole of order k not a zero of order k um that's a type of um, this this is this is a type of isolated singularity. So this is like more like what we're doing. We're basically um, like the way that this phi right in that thing I'm erasing right now could be defined at z naught in a nice way. Um, this is basically the kind of same thing here. So the intuition you should take from this is that this is basically the generalized deformation theorem plus Cauchy's integral formula. I said that probably in a very confusing way but th that's really what I'm trying to bring up. Um, and just to be clear in case I didn't say that, the residue f at zi is obviously the residue and i is obviously the index, the, the winding number, which we did before, right? Back with Cauchy's integral formula. Okay, so the picture here is this. It's not too bad, we've got the residue. Um, basically, so you've got points z1, z2, z3, some curve gamma, Maybe you got some point Z4, I don't know, right? And F is uh, analytic on A, except maybe at Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, or something like that, right? Um, those are isolated singularities of F. Then if I go around gamma, like this with F, uh, integrate around it, I get 2 pi I, sum of the residues, and because this gamma only goes around it, like wraps around it once, I guess we're assuming in this picture it doesn't do it like two times over its... Uh, you know, it's a domain. Um, we just get indexes are one, right? If it if it went around twice or something, then you would get indexes of two and so on, right? Or if it went around one of them twice, that is maybe if you had some kind of business where, you know, you went around one of them more than once, that is like you went like, you know, like, oh, I'm gonna go around you and then I'll go around you again or you know, three times even or something, right? Like then you could maybe have, you know, a, a different multiplier for one of these than the other ones, right? You see what I'm saying? Okay, fair enough. So that's sort of the picture to keep in mind. We just have these little multipliers right here given by the index and then the residues are the, the terms we're basically summing up and we have this two pi i multiplier at the end of it. All right, nothing too weird. So let's, let's try this out. Let's do an example. Let's evaluate the integral about gamma of one over z squared minus one dz. Here we'll take gamma to be the circle with center zero and radius two. The picture here to think of is uh, this. This is gamma zero radius uh, two. So this would be 
like minus two and that would be two and this would be two i and minus two i all right then you've got one and minus one obviously if your function is uh one over z squared minus one then this is just you know um oh, i should put the hats on that one one over uh z minus one z plus one obviously right and so okay bada boom we got our two uh isolated singularities right there and so i'm going about this guy and what we're going to say at the end of the day we're going to justify by going through and doing this um we justify it with this residue theorem and uh, we go through and we calculate that we just have to do it around each one of these guys and what these two pieces are given by comes immediately from our previous work with the residue uh with calculating residues so okay cool so just do this two pi i residue of this guy at minus one plus the residue of this guy at one since this thing's just wrapping around at once the indexes of these guys you know just one right okay cool so what is the residue of one over z squared minus one at minus one and what is it at one well we know how to do this from before right we're just going to do some deriving right Oh, okay. And in fact, we're gonna just drive tops and bottoms, yeah? So that was, uh, if, I, if I pop this open quick, 4.1. You will see immediately what we are talking about from last time. Oh, that's the... Uh, the double hole piece we don't need that yet um this whole business where we were saying hey derivative derivative of the bottom that whole thing right so that was that was the whole thing we were just doing that kind of stuff we we calculated all this sort of thing last time but um just remember all we're doing is we're doing one more derivative on the bottom basically than we do on the top yeah okay so we do that over again here and then on the bottom, we'll do a, a one derivative, I'll get 2z, do a derivative over here, I'll get 2z, right? Same thing, right? And then so one of them I'll plug in um, minus one, one of them I'll plug in one, and bada boom. Cool. So it's got a, um, just put those two together, minus one half plus one half, get zero, right? The two pi i doesn't matter anymore. And so there we are, we've gotten what we want. Oh. We've gotten what we want. The answer is zero. Okay, so kind of the uh, the whole business of calculating residues, you know, let's push all that back to what we did before, not dwell too long on it right here. Basically, the whole business is that as long as you can calculate residues doing what we did in 4.1, which we had a whole bunch of different approaches for it, and indeed in your textbook, there's actually a great uh, table of different approaches and ways to do it. And if you uh, remember what the index is, then we can calculate kind of a lot more contour integrals. It's a, it's a pretty cool trick. So what, how do we prove this? How do we prove this theorem right here, 4.2.1? How do we do it? Well, like I've alluded to a lot of different times, let's just uh, recall a few old propositions. Um, the first one, Proposition 3.3.3. This uh, was one we just did a little bit ago. Okay, so if F is analytic on a region A and has an isolated singularity at Z0 with residue B1 at Z0, and gamma is any circle Z0 in A whose, whose interior except for the point Z0 lies in A, then the integral about gamma of F of Z dz is the residue times 2 pi i. So another way to write residue times 2 pi i is actually write the residue f and then the colon z naught uh, 2 pi i. Okay, so this was when gamma is a circle around z naught and um, notice this is just a circle that goes around one time. We're not trying to say it goes around more than once or anything. It's just a circle that goes around one time. All right. So we dealt with this before 
we we've seen this you can start to see okay I've got two pi i and a residue okay I got a two pi i and a residue now these these indexes maybe we have to like have those go in there if we're dealing with something more than just a circle around z naught going around at one time right but we're breaking things up into sum and the reason we're breaking things up into sum is because of this piece that came from a homework we talked about this in class one time before um, it is given in your textbook as a worked example example 2.2.9 from quite a while ago uh, back from Cauchy's uh, it, actually I think even before Cauchy's integral formula um, this was the deformation theorem okay so the deformation theorem told us uh, that if gamma 1 through gamma n this generalized version at least are non overlapping simple closed curves and that gamma is a simple closed curve in F and um, closed curve with F analytic on the region between gamma and these sub gamma 1 through gamma n these sub curves um, then the integral about this thing is equal to those guys so remember this deformation theorem uh, didn't necessarily like Cauchy's theorem say everything was gonna be zero it just told us inequality right okay so here we've got some curve this is the picture of the generalized deformation theorem you've got some curve gamma You've got some curves gamma one two and three inside of gamma and this region between gamma and these other curves that's all shaded we're assuming at least that f is analytic on this part okay well indeed if you have uh, some curves like in this one enclosing some isolated singularities and something like one over c squared minus one in this example notice this guy is definitely analytic on the area I'm like crappily shading right now you see what I mean so the generalized deformation theorem definitely applies right this is a totally acceptable thing to use and if you don't remember how we did this the way we did it was uh, a pretty cool little trick where we just built a different closed curve namely we built this curve here where we went around gamma and then we went down and around and back up and then we went around went down oh other, other way we went back up and around down around back up and back to where we started since each one of these has me going uh, down and back these little chunks which I think we called like gamma one tilde, gamma two tilde, gamma three tilde. Every one of them has like a down and back. Those pieces, since they're just the same path with reversed orientation, cancel each other out. All right, and this is the picture I'm trying to draw, right? So you've got obviously a piece that's going this way and a piece that's going that way. You see exactly what I mean. And so this new thing is one curve right and in reality what we actually have to do is we have to like build this like a little bit like keyhole style so they don't go exactly along the same thing and so that's more like a uh, building like um like this where it looks like um so you go like uh you know down and around and then I go back up right and you do like this business and really I should have actually with this erasers taken off uh, those little chunks right made these like some epsilon width and then showed uh it's like this is like some like little epsilon width like keyhole right and then showed that as I shrunk those epsilons down to zero, um, it you know gave me the same result. And uh, that, that'll end up being obvious because when I'm doing something like this, hey, if F is analytic on all of this region, look, it's a closed curve and F is analytic on and inside this closed curve, right? Cauchy's theorem, zero. So when I take this limit and I still get zero, and then what I get is that the integral about gamma of f plus integral about all these other pieces is zero, right? So, you know, gamma i, and maybe I should do it like this. I'll write it like this. Um, 
plus uh, the sum from like i equals one to three in this in this picture of the gamma i is zero, right? Because of uh, this logic, right? Okay, and then because of that, and I know that these uh, gamma tildes cancel each other out, so I didn't even write it right here. Um, we will immediately get um, that we. Oh, and I should actually say because when we're going around these guys, notice I'm going the wrong direction around them. That is, I'm going like this around it here while this guy really goes the other way, right? And so these are like minus gamma eyes. And so when I flip it, then we're good to go, right? Because, you know, when you build these little keyholes, you could you could have them go basically, you know, this is this is how they actually have to go, right? Like you can't, you know, go in and somehow keep going in the uh, counterclockwise direction. Like, you know, like, um, you see what I'm saying, right? You suddenly turn into clockwise direction even if you're going counterclockwise around it, right? Relative to that subcurve. Okay, I'm sorry. It's too hot. It's way too hot here. Um, but anyways, uh, I think you all get that. We've talked about that piece before. That's the generalized deformation theorem. That's what's going on there. And if you take this piece, which let us break down a contour integral into a contour integral about a bunch of little curves inside of it, then pretty obviously if we have A, a region, and some points, I'll just draw two of them, like Z1 and Z2, such that F is analytic everywhere except for these isolated singularities, then obviously if I have some curve that goes uh, around these guys, I could make some little subcurves in fact, even just circles, how about, around these guys. And I could, you know, figure out the contour integral about this guy by summing up the contour integrals around these little guys, right? Oh, kind of cool. And notice, though, the thing I have to keep track of is the index of this surrounding curve. That is, if it goes around twice, then when I'm doing this trick, I'll end up basically doing each of these guys twice as well, right? If it goes around 15 times, I'll end up doing each of these like little guys 15 times as well. If it goes around one of them more than others, I'll end up doing that one more times than the same number of times, um, but more than the others. The same number of times that I do that one relative to the surrounding curve, I will do it the same number of times with this small curve. All right. So that's the entire business, and that's that's exactly how we prove it. This is the intuitive proof of the residues theorem uh, for simple closed curves. All right. So we're supposing that gamma is contractible in A to a point in A, and the inside of gamma lies in A. Or since it is, then the inside of gamma lies in A. I mean, obviously, if it's contractible in A, then the inside of gamma lies in A, right? It's contractible to a point it's already in there then got to be there okay so each zi lies on the inside of gamma okay that's one of our assumptions we have to have um or at least we have to have that none of them are on it now notice we could have some of them that we're just kind of ending up discounting for example you could have something over here since it's not inside the curve we don't have to care we might as well pretend that it isn't there right we could always um you know, just uh, restrict our A to a smaller subdomain, you know, just like do A as like this trunk instead and kind of get rid of uh, this piece over here. And then you've got all of them right like that. So we're going to just suppose that. We're going to suppose that each ZI lies on the inside of gamma, because if it wasn't the case, we could always just by the assumption that each gamma there that none of the zi are on gamma we could always just exclude from a some of the pieces that maybe aren't inside gamma right okay now around each zi we'll draw a small circle gamma i small enough to be inside of gamma and surround none of the other zk so none of the other points it's exactly the picture that i just drew up here little pink circles around each point none of those circles you know if you had like a z3 uh like right here then even though maybe i could like draw a circle that goes around like both of them right 
we're saying don't do that do the small pink circle and similarly just do a small circle around this guy right okay so we're gonna draw a circle small enough we can always do that because these are isolated singularities right you can always isolate them with a neighborhood okay so we're going to draw circles small enough to be inside of gamma and surrounding none of the other ZK. Then we'll apply the generalized deformation theorem to say that, hey, integrating about gamma is the same as integrating about, or, you know, summing up the integrals about um, these gamma i's, these little circles. Oh, and why is that? Well, it's because F is analytic on the region between those circles you know, between those circles and uh, gamma, just like in this picture. It might not be analytic on the dark patches um, in inside the curves, and indeed it, it won't be at all the points. It will be non-analytic at the isolated singularities. But we can still break it apart like this using this kind of throwback result from chapter two in chapter two, section two. Okay, so since F is analytic in all of these guys and or it, analytic in gamma and the region between gamma one through gamma n, right? Um, we can break it up like this. Now, all of these guys, let's assume they're all traversed in the counterclockwise direction. Then immediately what we get since proposition 3.3 .3 tells us that the integral around any circle for F is two pi i times the residue. Well, then we get that the integral about this is the sum of these residues times two pi i, extracted two pi i from every term of that sum. Easy, okay. That's the residue theorem. Since gamma, the index of gamma at uh, z i is one for every one of these singularities z i, and indeed for any z inside gamma. Um, but okay, now what about, wh why do these indexes appear if we're just gonna get rid of them? Well, realistically, it's for exactly the reason I just said. And if you want to get that, then basically what you do is say, hey, if you have a curve of index, say, greater than one, then what we have to do is we have to break that curve up into subcurves with um, index one. And then we can sum up over, uh, you know, the, the, the index of that curve at that isolated singularity many subcurves. So this is maybe a slightly more technical piece. We'll talk about this more next time. But intuitively the idea is basically exactly the same as what we were doing with Cauchy's integral formula, which um, here I'll even let me pull this up really fast. It's right here. Okay, there we go. Wow, we are way past this point. This is fun how far back we have to, to go to get this. All right, before that. Oh, perfect, okay. So this is like that strengthened form of uh, Cauchy's integral theorem for a disk, right? That whole thing. Oh, no, I went too far. Oh, oh, oh man, here. Sorry, guys. I will. Yeah, no, it's gotta be like right around here. I should have had this pulled up in the book uh, prior to starting, but I didn't think I would need it to. There we go. Okay, found it. Oh, here, I'll even just, uh, I'll copy it over. Okay, so really the whole the whole uh, gist of what what I'm saying, just to recall it 
for everyone to bring it bring it on back is uh, Cauchy's integral formula right here. I might as well actually write it instead of just uh, casually saying it. Um, so this was 2.4.4. So if F is analytic on a region A, gamma is a closed curve in A that is homotopic to a point, and Z naught in A is a point not on gamma, then we got this whole business. And we got a slightly strengthened version of this that actually let us deal with the case where F is maybe not actually analytic, say, at a specific point, right? So, I mean, the idea of combining this with um, the generalized deformation theorem, it, just think about, okay, so if F is analytic everywhere, then combining this with the general generalized deformation theorem tells us that um, if we just replace these Zs right here with some... Um, like z1 through like zn right the points not on gamma then what this turns into is a summation from like i equals uh even even let's do z0 right there right i equals 0 to n and we just turn these into zi's right and those are subscripts and hey look i've got this piece right here kind of cool right and there should be something suggestive here right so I've got FI's indexes I'm summing them all up some kind of an integral right here and notice this function right here F is analytic on in this case all of a a region but when I take make this rational function F over uh, F of Z over z minus zi let's call this like g of z right this guy has a simple pole at zi right gi of z how about this has a simple pole at zi right oh whoa that's that's kind of exactly what we're dealing with right now sort of right oh wait a second so or pretty similar at least. So if I multiply like, you know, Z minus uh, ZI, right? Times GI of Z is F of Z or something, right? This is, uh, an F is analytic. This is kind of like what we were talking about before where we're like, hey, you know, if you can multiply by, you know, Z minus ZI to like the K or something and get out something. This is what we were doing in 4.1 when we were calculating residues, right? Um, We'll talk about this more next time, but hopefully this is um, at least like bringing some of this old stuff back, right? You're starting to see the connection between uh, this piece and the new residue piece, right? That it's all generally part of the same story. We're just extending that story into the full Laurent expansion piece. Um, and that's kind of cool. So that's that's really the whole business of what what we're doing at this point. We're just taking residues um, sort of in place, if you want to think of it, in place of uh, function evaluations. And some people I'm sure would not like that way of looking at it since here I'm integrating F DC while over here I'm integrating F over Z minus ZI DZ, right? But for the reason I described, this function has a uh, pole of order one at zi right a simple pole um and so there really isn't that much difference between the two things we'll do a lot more work with this you'll get a lot of chances to practice this and we'll do a much more uh rigorous proof and talk about some of the implications or you know things that you have to deal with with the residue theorem uh next time but i think that is a good first introduction to one of the more important theorems in, I would say in all of complex analysis. So we'll get a lot of use out of this. This will be a big one. Um, and I think that is a great place to stop for the week. All right, cool. Have an excellent Friday.